Well, good morning. It's nice to see so many faces out there. I'm not sure if we're getting a bounce from the, the early morning Packer game last week or not, but we'll take it. Um, so I'm Eric, and this is my lovely wife, Molly, uh, wife of 23 years today, nonetheless. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so thank you so much for inviting us to share today. Um, as uh, Brian mentioned, we've been really members of Meadow Cricket since around 2006. Um, the Meadowbrook family has played such an important part uh, in our spiritual development and leading up to missions and being with us on mission. Um, so thank you so much for your partnership, your prayers, and your encouragement. We couldn't do it without you. Um, behind me is a picture of our family um, when we left for the field in 2010 and a new uh, version uh, from this year. We have three sons, Quincy, uh, Emmett, and Nicholas. Um, we minister in Chad, Africa. Uh, as you can see, uh, Chad is in uh, North Central Africa. You can see some of the countries that are surrounding it. Um, the climate of Chad is also very split. So split uh, Sahara Desert in the very north and in the south is the transitional zone called the Sahel, which is between desert and lush green Africa. Chad is also split uh, very uh, distinctly because of culture and religion. Um, the south West corner is almost all animist and Christian populations, and the east and the north are almost all Arab and Muslim. Uh, we work in the far southwest corner, um, and it's a 99% uh, Muslim area. And as we serve in Chad, we try to be good neighbors and learners of the Muslim context in which we live. And Eric, being a doctor, he used his medical knowledge to serve via community health work. And for us, it's about following the call like Abraham. We are blessed to be a blessing and to preach the gospel in word and deed. And it's our hope to one day see a thriving, indigenous, reproducing group of followers of Jesus. So our life in Chad, like on a daily basis, immerses us into the very issues that Paul is addressing to the church in Rome. If you can see on the next slide, there's things like animal sacrifice, foreign religious practices and holidays, and issues regarding women and covering their hair and so on. And so we're hoping this morning that as we share the message with you, that our life experiences in this context that so often resembles biblical time will help shed light on the passage this morning. So last week, Brian shared from the first half of chapter 14, and he explained how there's a group of Gentile and Jewish believers who are just trying to figure out how to be Christians in this huge pagan city. And their testimony and unity were essential for the advancement of the gospel in Rome. And in scripture, it tells us the strong believers are not to judge the weak. The weak being those who maybe are holding on to certain restrictions. And the strong being those who understand the freedom in Christ. So Brian's point last, night, last week was the importance of the how we engage in disputable matters. And the how is with love and respect. So this week, as we kind of move further into the second half of chapter 14, we want to dig a little more into this how do we engage disputable matters with our brothers and sisters in Christ. So if you will stand with us while Eric reads from Romans 14, starting at verse 13. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person, it's unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not, by your eating, destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace 
and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food's clean, but it's wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It's better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat because their eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith is sin. All right, you can sit down. We just love to stand up and honor the word of God. So just prior to this text, we're reminded that Jesus is Lord and judge. Jesus. Not me and not you. Jesus is not asking us to be judges. But he is encouraging, encouraging us to try and live out the Christ-like characteristics that he models for us. Mercy, compassion, patience, selflessness. Not judges, but servants. And we can be so quick to judge. And we can be really slow to love. Jesus encourages us to live in his upside-down economy. An economy where I am to love my enemy and to pray for my persecutor. In cultures like ours that really promotes individuality, self-truth, self-gratification, the way of Jesus is mind-blowing, and that is what sets us apart. But in order to walk this narrow and high road that leads to life in abundance, because it really does lead to life in abundance, we need to really believe in who Jesus is. And we need to be confident that his word is truth. So that when we take steps of faith that say, make up your mind to not be a stumbling block, or to make every effort to do what leads to peace and unity, we need to have that foundation. And when we do it, we are blessed. So with that in mind, let's dig into the second half of chapter 14. And as Eric and I read scripture and prayed and dialogued, there are really five things that we wanted to bring up and share with you today. Don't be a stumbling block. Do what leads to peace. Do what leads to mutual edification. Strive for unity. Trust and allow the work of God. So we'll begin with don't be a stumbling block. As Paul states, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. So what is a stumbling block or obstacle? Uh, many Jews would be repulsed by even the thought of eating meat sacrificed to idols or meat that wasn't prepared in a kosher way. This belief was deeply rooted in their identity, devout faith and upbringing. For many, this was not a disputable matter. You simply did not do it. In our chatty and Muslim context, we encounter these types of beliefs and practices on a daily basis, including what hand must you use to extend money with, not eating pork or drinking alcohol, not being able to hold my wife's hand in public, uh, or wearing shorts on the street. Yeah, one thing when we're in the States that we really like to eat is bacon. Like, you want to serve us bacon and eggs or BLTs, bacon on burgers, bacon straight up. Like, you give it to us, we'll eat it. <laughs> and that is because when we are in our ministry area, we choose to not eat pork. Pork to our Chadian Muslim friends is repulsive and it's dirty. So why would we choose to eat something that's going to put a stumbling block between our, brothers and, or between our Muslim neighbors? Like, there's already enough things that we have to kind of fight to get over and to gain their ear that we don't need to eat pork and to gross them out. And another thing is head coverings. In our context, and often for Muslims around the world, women cover their hair. It would be highly disrespectful if a woman didn't. And to be honest, she would be considered an infidel or a prostitute. So I do not need to go out on the street and like wave my freedom around without covering my head. 
I love my Chadian friends, neighbors, and I love Jesus. It is not hard for me to do that. So there's these simple things, you know, that maybe we might think, oh, my freedom, my right. But in the end, we are blessed when we believe what Scripture says. Paul even says, blessed is the one who does not condemn himself for what he approves. And I have found that so often to be true. It's, people often will say, thank you for covering your head. They are acknowledging that I am trying to respect their culture, and so often it leads to spiritual conversations. Yeah, some of these issues might seem very small, but they're really huge when people have grown up in the church or in a different uh, culture or religion. These cultural issues are what I call baked into their theology or worldview. I may not be able to persuade people on certain issues or practices through rational discussion. If you want to dialogue with them on these issues and you even consider something disputable or negotiable, they may become distressed or bristle or pull back from relationship or most likely just kind of talk about you behind your back. If you're seen doing or claiming these things, they may deem you unclean, unfit, and undesirable. In fact, we've often heard from our friends and neighbors based upon what they see on TV that all Christians, that's you, get drunk, sleep around, and don't take their faith seriously. And as such, it's Christianity that's corrupting the world. So why would our neighbors want anything to do with Christianity when that's what they believe? The missional concept with Molly, which Molly was talking about has helped us understand where Paul is getting to is called contextualization, which seeks to find issues and patterns in a culture which seem rooted in theology, often deeply held beliefs, but which we and our freedom in Christ don't need to adhere to. We then willingly forego, give up, or concede these freedoms so as not to inflame or push people away from Jesus. While this principle tends to relate to people who are not yet in the faith, it can equally apply to new believers who want to remain in their context as Muslim background believers of Jesus. So we must decide, where will I draw the theological line in the sand? Are there issues or practices that I will willingly forego for the peace of mind and stable faith of a brother or sister in Christ? It's very interesting to reflect upon specific issues in Western evangelical Christianity which have moved from forbidden to disputable to acceptable, such as playing cards, alcohol, smoking, head covers when praying. I openly recognize that some still forbid these activities, and I very much respect that. It's not meant to make a judgment call, but merely make the observation that we all probably participate in some activities today which were forbidden in the past. In the light of this, what are some things to ponder along these lines in our modern setting? First, should we control what we post on social media? Are our posts potentially inflammatory, distressing, or provoking to fellow believers in our church? Are there certain types of media we consume or certain activities that we engage in which also may be distressing? Are there elements of our culture, our upbringing, our experiences, our politics, which have been baked into our theology. I state these things not to say that we need to change our lives or give these things all up, but I'm just merely asking, have we even processed this? Have we even considered it? Instead of just being an obstacle or destroying other people's faiths, Paul then exhorts us to the end of actively striving for peace between individuals in the midst of disputable matters by stating, let us therefore make every effort to what leads to peace. Stumbling blocks are about hindering or blocking people in their faith, but promoting peace is about actively pursuing harmony between believers. Another way of saying this is Paul is asking us to prioritize relationships and people over issues. What might this look like in the context of disputable matters? Well, when engaging in a disputable matter with a brother, the first thing we might want to consider is how we speak to our brother or sister. This might seem simple or obvious, but it also seems lost on me many of us, especially in this day of social media. Is how I'm speaking even kind? Is it helpful or encouraging? Is it building my brother or sister up? And then sometimes, when we're unable to resolve the issue immediately, I might choose several different paths. One, including 
speaking compromise into the discussion in order to avoid escalation or to avoid arguing for the sake of argument. We might simply give up the right to be right or agree to disagree on a certain issue. We can certainly find common ground on a multitude of other issues. Or I can wait and pray and let the Spirit speak into their lives, allow the Spirit to convince them of what is true. We might want to ask ourselves, is now the right time to really engage in this specific issue? Are they ready or in a good place to hear it? And finally, sometimes we just need to prioritize relationship. Get to know the person. Spend time with them doing a multitude of other things. Serve them so that they can see and know your heart in the matter. Sometimes letting our lives speak breaks down barriers and builds trust to the point where then we can have a deeper discussion. So many of you are probably familiar with Sally. Sally is a friend of ours who left Islam to follow Jesus about eight years ago. And this was totally new territory for our team to disciple a Muslim background believer. Even though it's what we had hoped for and we were working towards, it was still like, oh my gosh, this is happening. And so we moved forward very carefully with a lot of prayer and seeking the Holy Spirit because she was, she was the one that was facing persecution. You know, at one point, we started to dialogue about baptism. You know, she had been following the Lord for a while, and this is a natural step in letting the world know that you've chosen to follow Jesus. So we read scripture, and we talked a lot about it, and she totally agreed, yeah, I want to be baptized. But it took a really long time for her to go through with it. And so our team just gave it to the Lord, and we prayed. And we just were patient and giving her time to grow in her faith. Because in reality, who were we to tell her what to do when she's the one facing persecution every single day? And God knew. And God grew her. And then the Holy Spirit led her to make the decision to be baptized. So those are some of the ways and examples we can foster peace between individuals in the midst of disputable matters. This can be really hard work. And sometimes, instead of engaging in the process of fostering peace, we choose a different route. We know we're not supposed to draw, draw a theological line in the sand. So instead, in avoiding the hard work, we just merely stick our head in the sand. What might sticking our head in the sand consist of? Well, first, it might be just mere apathy or ignoring that person altogether. I'm just, I'm just simply won't engage with them. I'll let them and their group kind of do their own thing. Or we can kind of just plead ignorance, like, I'm not going there. I'm not going to that subject. It's just too touchy. Um, one such example for us in Chad is female circumcision. Um, it would be very easy for us to steer clear from this issue. Um, it's very sensitive. It's, sometimes it's done covertly. Um, it's very deeply ingrained in the culture. And it could cause very serious problems for the families if it was ever found out. But this is one issue which we cannot merely ignore, and we need to continue to engage. So we, chose, we choose not to go to those celebrations. We choose not to give money in support of it. But we do continue to engage on the topic whenever we get a chance. So fostering peace between individuals is hard but essential. And Paul then takes us another step further in the very same verse by stating, Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace, and to mutual edification. So what is mutual edification? It's mutual growth in the faith. It's neither sticking your head in the sand nor drawing a line in the sand. And good conflict resolution often leads to both sides learning. Last week, Brian encouraged us to get curious and get together when we're facing a disputable matter with one of our brothers or sisters in Christ, when we engage with love and respect, willing to be a listener and a learner, we are often led into deeper discussions, and both sides end up learning and growing. And what does mutual edification require? We need to recognize that all of us are in process. We need to humble ourselves and presume that we can learn something from the other. 
And we need to examine what we believe. Am I fully convinced of it? Is it truth, or is it possibly culture, politics, or upbringing baked into my theology? Let's face it, nobody perfectly models Jesus. Nobody. <laughs> and who here can stand up and say, my doctrine and theology is 100% accurate and has not changed over time? God knew that our culture is going to evolve and change. It doesn't mean that God's word changes, but how we interpret that and how we let that out. I know that from where I, when I first accepted Christ right now, I live and believe in things that are aligned with Scripture, but I've chosen to maybe stop doing certain things or choosing to do certain things. So Paul then goes on to state, So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat, because their eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith is sin. So if I haven't first wrestled through a disputable matter in prayer with God, I need to be wary that I'm condemning myself. I need to be careful not to draw a line in the theological sand for others if I still have some doubts. When we avoid putting stumbling blocks and obstacles in the way of people seeking or growing in Jesus, when we seek peace in our relationships within the church through compromise and prioritize people over issues, and when we work hard to understand each other and honestly engage issues, we can all move forward through mutual edification. But as you read this passage slowly, you can sense a growing excitement as Paul admonishes the faithful in Rome. It almost seems like there's a deeper end underlying all of these admonitions. What is it? We find this by continuing the dialogue in chapter 15, where we see that Paul is leading us to the greater end of unity. Verse 15 states, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. If peace had to do with individual harmony, unity has to do with corporate harmony. As you read through the entirety of 14 and then into 15, it seems like the unity of the body rises as a central end to what Paul is advocating for. And if we look at Jesus, he too saw something central and powerful about the unity of the body. Drawing from his last words to his disciples before he was executed, he stated, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought into complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Every time I read that passage, I am struck that Jesus is talking about us specifically. In this day and age, He's praying for us that we would be brought into complete unity. Our unity is a testimony to God's love and to Jesus Christ. When we put peacemaking and mutual edification into practice, we generate the greatest possible opportunity to maintain unity. Does this always work? No. But if that was Jesus' take on the importance of unity, we must take it very seriously. So keeping unity is not always easy when we're not seeing eye to eye. It takes a lot of work, patience, and perseverance. And loss of unity can be extremely draining and painful and really should be the last resort. And last week, Brian asked the question, should we ever leave the church? And he said, yes, sometimes. You know, and sometimes it's actually better if that happens. You know, trusting that God knows. And we even see that there's division in the church and in Scripture. However, we need to recognize that when we leave the church because of disputable matters, it's really painful, 
And it doesn't only affect ourselves. It actually affects the people around us. When we left for the field in 2010, we left feeling really deeply connected to Meadowbrook Church. And so then four years later, we come back and we're super excited to connect with the body and also kind of wondering how do we fit in after four years of being apart. So shortly after we arrived, we met with our pastor and his family to share a meal. But to be honest, when we left that night, we felt really discouraged and a little bit disoriented because he had told us that they're leaving the church. That was a bit of a shock when you're gone for four years to hear that. So after he shared that news with the congregation, we witnessed a domino effect of people leaving. Now, we need to acknowledge that we don't know the details or the facts or the reasons, and nor do we blame or fault anybody. But we share this to communicate that there is a rippling effect of loss and grief when we choose to destroy unity, especially when it comes to disputable matter. But praise be to God that he is gracious and merciful. This is his church. Our God is a God of redemption and restoration. And we are so encouraged to see the rebirth and the life here today at Meadowbrook Church. It is so encouraging to us. Amen. <laughs> and I think about the body that was here and that they persevered and they humbled themselves before the Lord and they pursued his kingdom purposes and God blessed it. Our love and unity for each other is so important. We cannot take it for granted. It testifies to the love that God has for us and for all people and the extent that he is willing to pour out for us. And yet, there seems to be something more pressing, if you can believe it, perhaps even more primary to the unity that Paul is trying to talk about in Romans, this pushing toward or advocating something more. He states, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Yeah, so we need to ask ourselves, what is the work of God? What makes a work of God? I believe the work of God that Paul was referring to was bringing together these two very unlikely people with deep divides culturally, religiously, and historically, with the Romans oppressing the Jews, and a history of the Jews being told that they were to remain separate from Gentiles or just become unclean. Their unity was one of extreme improbability, if not impossible, but for the work of God through the unifying life of Jesus. This union was something only God could bring about, and maintaining that testimony for the world was paramount. There's something inherently divine when a group of very different individuals assemble and when there's reconciliation and fellowship between warring factions. The ultimate end in all of this is to reveal the work of God. This is the end we must keep at the forefront of our minds and motives. There is so much more at stake than what I believe about any specific issue, particularly a disputable matter. We engage disputable matters because the glory of God is at stake. The type of unity we see in Romans is the type of unity only God can bring about, and therefore only God gets the glory, only God gets the praise. This is otherworldly, the wild stories that capture your heart and inspire, something that leads us to say, Amen, thank you, Lord. Why are people so enthralled with Sally's stories? It's because it's so improbable, it's, it's impossible. It's only through the work of God, and it's not about incredible people doing incredible things. It's about normal people being used by God for impossible things. The further we go into Romans, we then see that Paul doubles down on what is at stake in disputable matters by linking unity to the missional heart of God for all people. Paul writes in Romans 15, 
Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant to the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed, and moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing praises of your name. Again, it says, rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him, the Gentiles will hope. Could it be any clearer? Engaging disputable matters is important because there are people who don't know Jesus. People who have been hurt shunned or turned off from Jesus because of disputable matters. There are marginalized, oppressed people, people who toil in unjust, deep poverty outside the kingdom of God with nobody near them or like them to tell them about Jesus. Paul's pleas flow from God's pursuing missional heart for all people to be in relationship with him. He's always drawing more into the fold which multiplies his praise and brings abundance to many. Perhaps this is a really great place for us to say thank you again to Meadowbrook. Thank you for allowing us to serve in what we believe to be the best job in the world with the greatest mission statement ever. We wouldn't want to be doing anything else. So thank you for your partnership, your prayer, and your encouragement. We couldn't do it without you, and that makes you too a part of this incredible missional endeavor. So what's this idea of God's missional heart mean for us? Jesus is always drawing us into more, into the improbable, the impossible, the darkest places, the most marginalized communities, the unreached and unengaged people. It's about your heart breaking for the things that breaks God's heart. What is it that God has laid on your heart that's breaking his, and he wants to use you for his kingdom purposes and his glory? Could it be that he's asking you to reconcile with someone? What issue in the church might be rubbing you the wrong way? What freedom is he asking you to lay down? What is he asking you to sacrifice? What next faith step is he asking you to take? It's not about suffering for God. It's about entering into God's heart. It's about joining him into the abundance of his redemptive work in the world. Bringing God's kingdom with us wherever we go out especially into the dark places and the hard places and where there's conflict. He wants us to be a part of that. I don't know what God is stirring in you, but I'd really encourage you not to push it to the back of your head. I want you to look at it and engage it. Ask God. He is good and he is faithful. Ask him, Lord, what do you want me to do to join in your kingdom purposes in your glory? He is good. May he be glorified. So let's finish with a prayer, um, and I'll be paraphrasing using Paul's words. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give us all the same attitude and mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had. So that with one mind and one voice we may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And may the God of hope fill us with joy and peace as we trust in him so that we all may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, may everybody here be witnesses to each other in this room, to Wauwatosa, to Milwaukee, and throughout the earth. May we be witnesses to the love of God and the grace and salvation of Jesus Christ and the fellowship available in his Holy Spirit. All of this for the praise of his glory. And all of, God, all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.